The story of Sharper is, um, it's a multifaceted story. <laughs> Sharper is a 2023 release directed by Benjamin Karen. The film starts with bookstore owner Tom, played by Justice Smith, meeting Brianna Middleton's Sandra. The two hit it off at once over commonalities. They both like to read, they both speak a little Italian, and it's really cute. That is until she disappears with $350,000 of Tom's money. From there, we are thrust into a non-linear story full of liars. There's Madeline, played by Julianne Moore, who is the potential trophy wife of billionaire Richard Hobbs, played by John Lithgow, who happens to be Tom's daddy. How do you say this man's name? John Lithgow? I wanted to cast my eye on who I think, and I guess this is a hot take, is the most interesting character in the movie, Max. I could care less about hot girl girl boss Maddie, or Mary Sue Sandy, or billionaire boy daddy, or Tom. Max is purposefully the most ambiguous character in the movie, and it really bothered me. Why did Karen choose to do this? And more was Max always so hard to read as this brooding Bucky incarnate. So I, I think the key to this movie is not Sandra or the money, not even Max really. I think this movie is most interested in Max's watch. But before we jump into that, let's get some spoilers out of the way. I feel like I was in a minority of people when I say I was waiting for the release of Sharper. The trailer was glossy with an Arena Grandy song set to Julianne Moore's Femme Fatale. The promotional interviews were secretive, with cast members talking about an unpredictable script and the need to go in with fresh eyes. And I know I'm too old to be naive, I know that, but I needed to know. What is the big twist? What can't you see coming? So yeah, I was all over that thing at midnight, and my fresh-induced Cannibal Sebastian stand obsession was only a minor factor in that. I like crime thrillers. I like narratives around con artists. So I watched it after paying for an Apple subscription, which is $2 too much now, at exactly midnight, February 17, 2023. And when it ended, after taking in the plot at face value, I thought, that's it? But now, having seen it five times, I think there's more than what lies on the surface when it comes to this film. The movie is divided into five sections. There is Tom, Sandra, Max, Madeline, then back to Sandy. The film tells these parts out of order, Really, the story chronologically is more like Max, Sandra, Tom, Madeline, and Sandy. I'll be covering these sections in chronological order, so it won't be the order that they happen in the film. Hopefully, you watch the movie. Seriously, go watch the movie, I'm serious. Go watch it now. So this is just a quick recap, but from here on out, I'm spoiling the movie in detail. In Max's section, we see Max and Madeline in a con. Max is posing as Madeline's difficult son. Madeline is dating Richard Hobbs, a billionaire widower. We see his son, Tom, come home from wherever or whatever. I cannot express to you how little I care about Tom. He was traveling or something? Anyway, Tom and Richard do not have a good relationship. Just a little nugget to keep in your mind for later. So the con goes down as planned after we see that Madeline and Max are not mother and son, but lovers. She's his love or mother. Richard pays Max an annual sum of $60,000 a month, a total of $720,000 and not a penny more. They say $750,000 for some reason, but that's not the number and I'm not going to accept that. So Max is ready to ride off into the sunset with Madeline, but Madeline backs out stating that she's going to marry Richard. Max leaves upset with the cash and Madeline marries Richie. That's Max's chapter. We find out later that Madeline has planned another con that Sandra pulls on Tom. She needs him to be cheated out of money, so Richard will deem his son irresponsible and leave all of his money to Madeline. So, and this is a lot of work, honestly. During Sandra's part of the film, Max finds Sandy, who is a heroin addict. He asks her politely to stop doing drugs and 
voila, she's cured. She doesn't do them anymore. And then he trains her to be Tom's dream girl and con him out of his cash. Part of the training for this is Sandra practicing on an unsuspecting adulterer with Max. And Sandra's chapter ends when she happy birthdays Max to celebrate the score. What are you doing? So, Tom's part is the first we see. It summarizes their fake relationship and how Sandra needs $350,000 to help her brother. Tom offers to provide the money and he hands her a bag of cash. When she doesn't show up later to meet him for dinner, he finds out he's been cheated and it's sad stuff. Subsequently, he has a nervous breakdown. Which brings us to Madeline. Madeline is living her best life sometime later at Richard Hobbs' funeral. She's been left the majority of his fortune. Hobbs had a charity foundation and he leaves that to Tom, but he makes Madeline a trustee. That's another nugget in your pocket to replace the tension between Richard and Tom that I mentioned because Richard's dead now, it's not important. I will remember you. So, Hobbs cut this boy out of the will faster than Tom walked out of that hallway, leaving enough money for him to have a bookstore and a modest living and not much else. While Madeline got a smooth nine billion something. She's ecstatic and living her best life after that. But the problem is Tom wants to find Sandra, who was trained by Max, who was hired by Madeline. So she tries to intervene, but Tom finds Sandra anyway. He does this with the help of a private investigator, Braddock. Sandra's strung out again and demanding to see Max. See, she says she waited for him for days, but he was a no-show. He took the money and ran off. Max is gone. So Sandra is blackmailing Madeline to find him or she'll tell Tom everything. Madeline finds Max after days of dealing with Sandra's violent withdrawals. They meet in a large parking lot, just Max, Madeline, and Sandra. Sandra confronts Max with the worst on-screen shoving I've seen outside of keeping up with the Kardashians. Literally, I will literally you. you up. Come here. You guys, my daughter's sleeping. Don't ever come at me like you that. Don't, I swear to God, I'll punch you in your face. You like waited for days and fucking loved me. How could you? You threw me aside like I was fucking trash. And then Tom comes with Braddock. Long story short, Tom pulls a gun. It ends up in Madeline's hands and he is shot in the chest. Madeline tells Braddock she'll give her whole inheritance to the charity foundation Tom inherited from his father. And Braddock reluctantly agrees. Max, Sandy, and Madeline make their way boarding a plane to run away from the crime. And Madeline explains to him that she didn't give away any of the money. She's a trustee of the foundation. Tom is dead, but the money is still hers. But she realizes she's been the victim of a con. Braddock was in on it and Tom isn't dead and Sandy isn't on the plane anymore. She's been conned out of billions of dollars. And now she's stuck with Jeff Galuli and no money, which sounds like my weekly viewing of I, Tanya, but that's another topic entirely. I don't want to talk about that. Okay, exclusions can be interesting in film. They can be unimportant information. We don't need to see Tom's nervous breakdown. The boy is just nervous. But they can be due to unreliable storytelling too. We don't see Sandy strung out again because it never happened. And this is where the $350,000 con comes in. When Madeline introduces Tom as a mark, we don't see it. We don't see her talk to Max. We don't know how she gets in his good graces again. We don't know how well they get on after she unceremoniously dumped him over the phone when his teeth were at their absolute whitest. I don't know why they look like that. This could be unnecessary for us, but it definitely is empty. Where's the revenge arc for Max that we could have had? Where is the rest of the movie? What about Max abandoning Sandra and taking all the money? We might not see it because Sandra doesn't really want to see Max, doesn't care about the abandonment, but why doesn't she care? Didn't she happy birthday Max in a hotel room? That's weird. Why does the film introduce this strange arc? 
He is her rescuer, her lover, says he cares little for her, but nurtures her, saving her from heroin and feeding her white castle. That feels like a place to mine drama, but nothing is missing if Max never abandoned her. They love different people, happy birthday once, and continued on with the con. But that leads us back to Max. If Max didn't trick Sandra, why would they lie about it? And how does this relate to the watches? I'll get to the watches. I will get to the watches. Benjamin Karen cites Clute as his primary reference and boy does it show. Sharper is reminiscent of Clute in its understated depiction of New York City and its emphasis on light and dark in its cinematography. There's a ton to unpack about the cinematography of Sharper. The movie looks good. It's sleek and visually captivating, its frames are dynamic, and its colors create a different mood for each perspective the film has. It was shot on 35mm film, lending it a nostalgic charm that at first glance you might not be able to put your finger on. It's not surprising that Karen had a viewing of Clute for the cast and crew to give them the impression of what they were trying to emulate. Clute is a detective story. A man goes missing and a police officer is hired to find him. He becomes embroiled with a call girl named Bree, connected to the case that is being stalked at the moment. Audio and film work separately in Clute. You hear Jane Fonda's Bree speak in therapy sessions as the film shows you Clute investigating or the duo leaving her apartment. The sound directly relates to the role that a tape recorder has in the film. There are tapes of Brie conducting her dates and a tape of a violent murder. These audio tapes are played and the viewer's mind is left to imagine what they are hearing. It makes the violation of voyeurism and stalking that Brie is feeling a more intimate violation. Her voice is disembodied from her person, dehumanizing her. It also makes the murder of the killer's victim more horrific, her terrified screams filling the dark room where the tape plays with no visual of the event. These are the titles of Clute. The tape recorder is important, an integral part of the film's plot, and even outside of that, the use of recorded voice alone is integral to understanding the character work of the film. And I think that Karen does this with Max's watch. These are the titles of Sharper. We're not only seeing a watch, but how the watch is made. If Karen is using Clute as an influence here, what does that mean? How is the watch integral to understanding the characters of Sharper? In the plot, Max has a boatload of fake watches. They're in the glove box of his car. He wears them and they look nice and they're supposed to be Rolexes, but they're fake. And when he meets Sandra, he uses them to cheat her probation officer and get her out of trouble. From here, we have established something about Max. He wears a watch when he's working in his most deceptive moments. This is intentional. Max's sleeve is always pulled up to expose the whole watch when he wears it. Often Sebastian Stan is showing one arm more than the other. He sits at the table with just one wrist exposed. He holds his hands in his pockets so that the wrist of one hand is hidden but the other wrist exposes his watch. Something interesting happens when we go back in time. Max isn't wearing a watch. So we have a timeline on the function of this accessory. I think this is important because Wait, wait a minute, what is this? What is this? What is that? What the hell is this? What? So when I decided to watch Sharper six times, I just watched it again while you were watching me, I didn't anticipate looking at other jewelry. There's something going on with Sandra's necklace and her vulnerability, for instance. I resolved to stay focused but Max doesn't wear a watch during the Max portion of the film. So my eyes wandered, and like any red-blooded American's eyes would, they landed on Julianne Moore. At first, this bummed me out. It ruined my theory. Max's watches were not special. Everyone wears watches. But I think that this discovery lent the function of Max's watch clarity. Madeline wears watches in this movie, a bit less conspicuously, but I think that's the point. 
I think Benjamin Karen wanted me, and specifically me, not you, he wasn't doing this for you, to devolve into a Charlie Day conspiracy spiral about the accessories in this film, to latch on to Max's watch and then slither my way slowly like a piece of putty and wrap myself around John Lithgow's wrist. John Lithgow's wrist? John Lithgow. There's one scene in Madeline's chapter of the film in which Madeline wears a watch. As she goes to confront Sandra, her watch is visible. And when she leaves after Sandra blackmails her, she pulls her sleeve down and covers her watch. And it feels like a shift in the character's role in the film, in her power. But it is worth noting that in the very section of the film that Madeline becomes a billionaire, you don't see her wear a watch nearly as much as she did before. Madeline wears a watch the most in Max's part, and I think there's a couple explanations for this. One is the role of power and the way that cons work. There is a straightforward power aspect. Madeline has the power. It is her con. She makes the decisions. She sees the situation with the most clarity. But there's more to holding power when performing a con. In Maria Konnikova's The Confidence Game, she outlines the role of false power. When we're feeling pressure, we grow far less able to think logically and deliberately. When we're feeling more powerful, we tend to feel as if we don't need others quite as much, and our ability to read their minds and the cues they throw off falters. There's nothing a con artist likes to do more than make us feel powerful and in control. We are the ones calling the shots, making the choices, doing the thinking. They are merely there to do our bidding. And so, as we throw off ever more clues, we ourselves become increasingly blind to the clues being thrown off by others. So there's this idea that not only does the watch signal power, but the ability to trick someone else about that power. Max empowers Sandra falsely. Does she really, as a down on her luck heroin addict, have any power? He gives her choices, but how much autonomy does she really possess? Still, he makes her feel like she does have power. Sure, Madeline has a dominating role sexually towards Max, I enjoyed that, but he thinks of them both as peers, not knowing that he doesn't have any power over her. He should not have thought that she would walk away from a billionaire to play his mother again and again. But this theory starts to fall apart when viewing Richard's watch, at least at first. Richard's watch is visible when he offers to pay Max off to leave. He is paying Max to go away. Max has all the power in the audience's mind. Sure, Richard Hobbs is a billionaire, but he just got scammed out of $720,000, which is the amount that it should have been, not $750,000, they lied. Both Max and the audience will place the power with a watchless Max, and although Richard could feel empowered by getting his girlfriend's son to just go away with a flick of the wrist, that's not what we see. Richard looks down and watches Max walk away with a concerned scowl, and the theory that the watch signifies that the wearer has power over someone who thinks they have the power loses momentum in the moment. This is the last use of a watch that I noticed. In other scenes, Richard's watch is hidden by his sleeve, just an outline under his suit. But here, it is clearly displayed. In Clute, with clarity of how malevolent the killer is, we get this shot, and Karen emulates it with Richard's glance down from the skyscraper. Everyone is a liar in this movie, and I think this shot tells us that Richard is not a mere mark here. It's cinematic language to let us know that in this moment, he's the sharper, not Max. Sure, Richard could just be a victim who never knows that he was played, but what if he wasn't? I'm just spitballing here, but do you think that the rest of the movie would be any different if Richard knew that this was a con? Wouldn't he still have gotten what he wanted if he knew that Madeline wouldn't walk away from marrying a billionaire? I don't think the watch marks a power struggle between two characters. Instead, I think it marks a conflict between the character and the audience. The audience was a massive preoccupation when making this film. They will admit to you early on, there was sometimes a temptation to show too much, 
because as an actor, what an amazing opportunity it is to be going, okay, well, in one way I'm playing this, but then behind that I'm playing something else. And I think as an audience, we are incredibly smart and savvy, even when you don't want to get your spidey senses going. So we all had to protect the intention of that character in that moment and to play that in the moment, understanding that if someone else in the room could have seen that, you have to guard against that. In a weird way, you've got to go back to when I first read the script, you're reading this story and all of those twists and turns were so brilliantly delicious that you want to hold on to the integrity of that. So we can recontextualize scenes with watches. The audience has been told Madeline is conning Richard, but more so she's conning Max. And there's something very interesting. When Max meets Richard, Richard is holding on to Madeline's watch. I think that signifies some sincerity on their part. The audience has been told Madeline is a con woman dating a Mark, but it's more complicated than that. Max says as much later. I don't like the way you look at him. Oh, come on. You like him a little bit. Of course I like him. He's a billionaire. That's not what I'm talking about. The audience is being told that Max is teaching Sandra how to con Tom. But he's teaching Sandra how to con Madeline. The audience is told that Richard is being conned, but Richard might be aware and doesn't care about the truth more than he cares about having Madeline. The audience is told that Max is just a bystander at the end of this film and that Max only cares about money, but he doesn't care about money. He wants Madeline back. He wants her destitute and desperate enough to stay with him, and this is his plan to make it happen. In the 2020 Blacklist script, Sandra is a sex worker and Max buys her. There's a coldness in how Max treats her that feels connected to her profession. Despite that, there's emotion and hesitation when Sandra asks Max if she ever meant anything to him. He's unsure and wants to offer an explanation before Madeline shuts him down. You got taken. That's what we do. That's changed in the film. He's firm when he refuses to apologize to Sandra, and Madeline has more reason to feel confident in the moment's sincerity. I felt nothing. In the script, the watches mean more in the plot. Madeline recognizes that both Braddock and Max are wearing the same kind of watch. Once she voices her suspicions in the script, they both bicker on the plane as they do in the movie. But the two of them realize that Sandra has left the plane in unison, looking to her empty seat as if in a 90s comedy film. This plays out differently in the movie. There's more ambiguity, more to disbelieve when presented with Stan's layered performance. The script provides the bones, the recorded intention, the watches are important and were always important. In the script, it is Tipsy, their accomplice in the film, who makes the watches. It is Max's watch that fills Madeline with doubt at the end. Remember I talked about the use of sound in Clute, the separation of Bree's voice and her image, and the titles of both films? Well, watch this. I think the tick of the watch, especially its change of speed, signifies the end of Max's con played on Madeline. You start in the middle of it, are brought back to the beginning of the con, and then filled in on its cause. Now you're just watching the end unfold. If you know about modern Submariner watches, even a little bit, you know that the tick of a Rolex is faster than a fix. It's an obvious tell. Now listen again. I think the speeding up of sound is intentional. We've seen Max feign emotion before the sound speeds up and we're left with this final look, something knowing underneath. Max's true intentions have lied under the surface all along, but now we have this auditory signal, a bookend of watches to mark the end of Max's confidence game. 
I said that I didn't think about Sandra's necklace, but that was a lie. I think about everything that has to do with this movie. And Benjamin Karen cared a lot more about Sandra than I did. So I wondered if the necklace could have any relation to the watches in the film. And I think, if my story is correct, that the necklace is the antithesis of the watches. Tom and Sandra never wear watches. They are in some way always sincere. And I think in her most sincere moments, when she's been caught using, when she approaches Tom to tell him about the con, the necklace is prominent. Its chain is even adjusted to fit the frame in these moments, even if it might not naturally. There's a reason that she's not wearing it when she performs her first con, and she's not wearing it when she happy birthdays Max. She's not wearing it on the plane. I think it signals how Sandy is different from a sharper. She's something else entirely. And I think that it adds to her character if she agreed to con Madeline with Max and use Tom to do it. I just think that makes more sense for her character and the script. It may be obvious, but rounds of reviews seemed too flippant for me to believe that it is. Spoiler articles framed Sandra as the character who gets the last laugh, and I haven't seen people mentioning the watches of the film in general. It's remarkable for Benjamin Karen to have helmed a movie that loads so much into just the wardrobe in a film that says a lot already with its lighting, use of color, and the framing of its setting. If you watch this and you haven't seen the film, which I literally told you not to do, you never listen to me, I swear. It's still a great watch. There's small rewarding details in building your own theories or grabbing onto mine as you watch, and it's fun finding them all. The film begs to be watched more than once. Almost everything that Max says is loaded with subtext if you think of most of the plot as his operation. Did she get to you? No. It's okay. I mean, it happened. She didn't get to me. I mean, you can do what you want. I don't care. She didn't get to me. It's good. More importantly, it aligns Madeline with the audience, bringing a thrill of hypocritical satisfaction. We see Madeline fall for lie after lie. We see it coming, it's predictable, and we judge her for it. All the while, we don't think about the small ways the film has lied to us too, the small lies we've taken in as truths. Madeline predicts our collective downfall, teaching Max what he needed to know to best not only her, but the audience. And if they're not looking for you, they don't see you. Xavier.